Chris, you're looking really cool. Oh, thanks, man. Uh, David Allen Co. inspired look. <laughs> You're always looking good, Tom. Oh, yeah, thanks. Tom. <laughs> Lots of hair. Yeah, we got started playing music, Tom, because um, we we're kind of bored during COVID at work. So we'd end the day with a variety show, and we he bought like a T-shirt cannon and um, weird, well, weird game show kind of stuff, and it was like a variety show, yeah, and we would play music at the end. And, and wait, I, I brought in all the instruments my grandpa had built, and it just kind of was like, hey, why are we doing the other stuff? Let's just play music. <laughs> so the variety show, it was were you doing it in front of an audience? It was just live on Twitch. We'd stream it, and we'd use, like, the OBS software so we can cut to cameras and stuff and cut to commercial and try to, like, create this whole thing that we just couldn't do because we didn't have the production. What's – I'm totally lost. you got to back up. What's yeah. Twitch? Twitch Who's is like a, it's actually for gaming mostly, but it's a streaming platform, so you can stream stuff. So you guys were basically making like a live show, and people on the internet, who wherever whoever were watching it. Yeah, but it'd only be like four people on the internet. Like I don't <laughs> even know where they're from. Yeah, that sounds Jay get, awesome. Jay would get really weird, and he would be like on microphone. He's telling like a really like like a, a dark story, you know, and like it gets really emotional at the end. And then we're like playing the instruments too, like. <laughs> And then you bust out the t-shirt cannon at some point? Bust out the t-shirt cannon. We'd always get, like, one person would just grab it and do it, and the rest would be like, oh, fuck! <laughs> it was, they'd, they'd shoot the shirts at you? Well, it's also confe it's a confetti cannon. Yeah, confetti cannon. That's what it was, yeah. It was a bunch really of them, like, little, though. like, oh. yeah. It was, it was, like, designed to be crazy, but it just was chaos. That sounds fun as hell. Yeah, it was fun. And it was so fun, especially happened. during, like, early COVID. So during the the music just was like a segment of your variety show at first. Yep. No shit. It was and just had, chaos too. Had either of you guys ever been in bands before, or did you well, just, just like, play with you and Apple yeah. Records? Is really yeah, it. yeah. And honestly, that was so much fun. Like that was awesome. That was really fun. That was the birth of Mountain Girls. It took a few years to incubate, but where it all started. Chris, when I first started asking you about this band, you used a term I had never heard before that I assume is like a real contemporary thing that I've just, am not like very hip to, which is new, uh, like new sincerity movement. Yeah. Could you just explain that to me a little bit? Jay knows more about it than me. We did an art residency and what, two of the people that were at the residency were part of that movement and like turn us onto it. They, is it like a visual art thing or like an all encompassing thing? I think it's all encompassing. They tried to make it like there's a manifesto out, and this was years ago. Honestly, I think they're like right as far as like pop culture goes, as far because it's followed in the path of what they kind of projected early on. But like the new sincerity manifesto, we had an episode on it on YouTube years ago, but it's just kind of weird. I, I was telling Chris, I think it's almost bigger picture. Like I'm gonna sound like an idiot, but it's a right. um, bigger picture. Like I feel like. The 90s were a lot of sarcasm, early 2000s, like like just in pop culture in general. And I feel like the like they were trying to project that this that was ending and there's this weird sincerity coming out of like anything. You know, it could apply to film, it could comply, apply to anything. And I think it's true. Do you think that goes hand in hand with the way that a lot of young people that have been just like brought up on the internet are obsessed with like authenticity? You know what I mean? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I hear that word thrown about so much, like in the past five years or something like that. It's all about authenticity, but it's yeah. always being talked about, you know, in terms of like somebody's content or some shit like that. Yeah, you know? that I think that would that would be more or less the same thing. And I think that yeah, that even sense. some of my favorite TV shows right now have this weird vein of like, like overly sincere. Like they're not being extra or, or sarcastic or anything. It's just like this. It is what it is. Well, the 90s were like a very cynical time, too. Yeah. And that was a real Gen X thing. Yeah. Like the 80s, like everybody was like totally burned out on like hippie shit and like everything kind of turned to shit. And there was so much Reagan. And then by the 90s, everybody like everything was a joke. And like, that's how people dealt with it, I think. Yeah. yeah. And so I think that this artist, I should go back and read it. It's been years. But I think that's kind of what the artist was saying, like that's ending. And now there's this new sincerity. So do you feel like in a way that kind of gave you guys permission as like uninformed musicians to just go for it and not worry about? I think I so. That's kind of what Chris and I've always done. 
I don't even think it was music though, because I would basically approach songwriting like I approach my art. So okay. it's kind of like, like hey, Nate, um, I don't I don't let not having a good idea stand in the way of getting art done. I just kind of well, sit down and make it. So okay. It's kind of like the same same thing where it's like, hey, what happened today or what do I want to think about? I had a sinkhole in my yard. I'm gonna write a song about a sinkhole. <laughs> um, but not having any familiarity with songwriting, I tend to get inspired by music that I'm listening to in the car and like, oh, I want to write something like that. Well, I think you hit on something important, which is, uh, to me anyway, and the way I think about a lot of this stuff, um, it, whether it's visual art or music, is that uh, it doesn't really matter if you have an idea at all when you're starting out because it's it's work one way or the other. Like you don't just have an epiphany and it becomes this thing and it's like prefab and done. Like you have to work on something all the time, whether it's something that goes anywhere or whether it's a dead end or what, it's all work. And it all requires um, setting, you know, trying and setting aside time for it and actually trying to, you know, do something. And not be afraid of it, trying, or yeah. even claiming that you're trying. Giving yourself the space to, you know, not everything has to have this crushing weight of expectation on it, you right. know. But what's interesting is I'll write, I'll write the lyrics and then we uh, practice. And then and initially, Nate and Jay would say, what's the song sound like? And I'm like, I don't know. I just know I just have the lyrics. Like, we got to figure that part out. But it was interesting because I was in Milwaukee and I was talking to Steve Tiber um, in your band, uh, Red Stuff. And I was kind of trying to figure out how you guys did it. He said it's the exact opposite. You guys jam and jam and jam and record it all. And then you meticulously like sit down and listen to all the jams. And pick out the the nuggets, and then start crafting the the lyrics from that. Well, I mean that's partially true, but it's it's always different. Like it's different all the time. Sometimes I'll have just like a line of words, you know what I mean? And I'm like, this is gonna fit in somewhere, or or I already know where it fits in, or uh, you know, there's not really. We do we do approach some stuff like that, but there's no set pattern. I feel like with my personal relationship with music, it's always changing. It's always different every time. And the more idea, the the clearer an idea I have in my head for what I want something to sound like, that's usually the farthest away from where it ends up. You know what I mean? Like yeah, for sure. if you really try and control something. I feel like you're uh, shooting yourself in the foot and tuning out all the other amazing stuff that could be happening. And it's- well, taking yeah, a, a long on, time. Chris would- bring us some lyrics or something and then be like, oh, what does it sound like? And then he'd be like, oh, it sounds, sounds like something like this is what he was inspired by or some, whatever the I song would be. A song of like what, something I liked that I thought, you know. And we obviously couldn't mimic it. it. And so it would be something completely different even though that's where it started. We argue with Nate a lot about timing because Nate is <laughs> timing obsessed as a drummer. And and I'm always like, what, what, you know, who cares? But it's like, but when we aren't obsessed with timing, it sounds like complete garbage. <laughs> so I guess timing is important. Hey, Nate. Hey, Tom. Nice to meet you. Before. Nice, to meet you. nice to meet you, too. Thanks for uh, interviewing us. Yeah, for sure. So you play drums in Mountain Girls? That's right, yes. How long I'm have you known? Other things. Okay. How long have you known uh, Jay and Chris for? Uh, Ten years. Have you been involved in some of their other art projects before the band? Uh, yeah, art, yes. Uh, not music. What's so your... Perfect. What's your relationship with music like? Have you been in other bands before or is this kind of a first for you too? This is a first, yeah. Okay. That's what made it so fun. It's a, it's a first for, for all of us, I think. Uh, at least um, they've kind of messed around a little bit before, but you know, we're all still relatively new. Did you so, choose uh, drums as your instrument or was it kind of chosen out of necessity? I would, no, say, was I would say both. <laughs> You know, I like it, and it, I mean, Jay was jamming, and I was, and then um, it just kind of decided on me taking over, but... You were um, bass, right? First? Huh? You were bass first, right? Yeah, yeah, bass that's first. right. But yeah. I mean, I had almost no experience in that, too, so, you know, I was game to try whatever. Made it an easy transition. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't fully committed to anything. I was just wanting to rock out. And it's a good feeling, isn't it? Rocking out, playing in a band? Uh, it was therapy. I don't know. I don't yeah. know what you guys talked about earlier, but I mean, it was during COVID, and it was just like, let's just freaking yeah. not think about fucking anything else. Well, yeah, what we, we were talking about basically. a minute ago is that uh, I was unfamiliar with this term, new sincerity, that Chris had used to describe your band's approach to music, and like that term has been like in my head ever since. I thought it was really cool, and I like that. Uh, 
my understanding of it anyway is that it sort of gives you sort of a blank slate or gives you like a permission, like a blank check to just do whatever you feel like you want to do without having to worry about, you know, uh, how it's going to be perceived or uh, how it might be judged or anything like that, because you're doing what you want to do. So that's what, you know, what more, what better could you be doing? But it's interesting, Tom, um, we had delusions of grand grandeur right away because during COVID we um, adopted a what 60 or 70 seat auditorium with a stage as our practice space. And we left I'm everything out. For that. It's unbelievable. And, and so it was like, it kind of felt real right from day one. It was so weird. I can't imagine how fun that is to be able to uh, have that kind of a space to just use like a blank canvas and just fill that room up with whatever you want to do. That's really cool. It's been phenomenal. Do you think that having that um, was encouraging early on rather than just being crammed in somebody's basement or something like that? I think it, it, it for me, I don't know about the other guys, but I felt like I wanted to keep buying stuff to fill up the stage. So we started buying speakers and monitors and guitars and a bass and like, let's fill the stage up. Let's get, let's get, you know, a, a mega setup going. You know, I think you guys have something really good going for you in that uh, your originality is very attractive as a listener, you know, like mm -hmm. there are so many bands that are, you know, accomplished and that they can sound polished or whatever, but boring, uninspired music is like one of the shittiest things in the world. And I think that people are interested to hear, you know, now more than ever are interested to hear like left field shit you know i think a major inspiration too was steve because steve got really excited that we were excited and was just like in his basement building crazy pedals and yeah. i was trading art for pedals and it was just like every couple of weeks there was this new sound where it was like what what's this thing it's a pitch witch and it makes it sound like a spaceship instead of a guitar the um sludge doom fuzz um, pedal and it was feeding back and i was singing through it and i was talking to you you know behind the scenes like how do i get this thing to work and you know, just getting advice and coaching, but it was yeah, he's a good time. It really, it's really helpful to have, uh, you know, one or two people as a touchstone or a sounding board like that, especially just um, when they're interested, you know, we yep. were, we were talking a little bit earlier about how uh, Jay was telling me about a movie that they made at the beginning of COVID and that um, it's just hard as hell to find anything to do with it once it's made. And I was saying uh, that it's the same with music, you know, like you can make something awesome, but just getting people to listen to it, even if it's free is like impossible sometimes. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, if you're not making it for yourselves, then it's kind of a pointless task. And you can hear the joy that is in your guys' music. And I really love that. I loved it immediately. Thanks. How, how do you guys approach um, experimentation and, and your and red stuff and other bands you've been in like what are you always trying to like pick up weird objects and make noises with it or you know no, you at I the mean, end or i i feel like my relationship with music is constantly changing and the the more i the less i expect out of it the, the better and better it gets and i feel like the older i get the more i can relax about it a little because i've always been the person that is also recording the music and uh, usually the person that has like had a role in writing the music. So I'm concerned. I'm <laughs> concerned is a good word to describe what's happening <laughs> when I'm playing music. I'm <laughs> trying to play it right. I'm trying to keep the equipment working. I'm trying to like not freak out if somebody in the band is fucking up too much. You know what I mean? And, yep. uh, and the more I can let go of all that shit and just enjoy what's happening and what I'm doing, the better and better it gets. Yeah, I feel like we have very low expectations. So sometimes we, we get a perfect on take one. And we just move on. <laughs> That's good. I mean, there's nothing better than a first take. Oh, oh, I'm, still, I'm still learning that. No, I know I know he's kind of joking, but... but Not the, really, though. I mean, sometimes it's like, hey, that it's good. It's what we wanted. It sounds energy, like what we wanted. Energy is always the best at the beginning. Always. Yeah. And I've been in situations where I've, you know, been kind of like, you know making it like drudgery for everybody else in the band like take after take and in the moment i can't see how stupid that is i think that we're right about you know we're just around the corner from getting it you know but then to take a step back and realize like god fuck that was awful for everyone you know it's 
because it's no fun and it should be fun and the energy's gone too so it's like why bother we've done that before too we've tried to revisit songs like okay it didn't work that day let's let's revisit and see if we can bring it back and we'll try it again and then we'll do it maybe a couple weeks later and it just doesn't happen sometimes it's better just to let it go yeah yeah it's or hard. maybe the time comes around at some weird time that you would never expect you know it's like yeah. when you're making stuff up out of thin air it's like anything can fucking happen with that you know and i feel like music is like that and especially uh spontaneous music or music that you give yourself the space to to be spontaneous and to experiment we had a super intense moment with nate uh what a practice or two ago for yeah, this, yeah. Um, song storm the castle which required what like really fast kind of repetitions yeah no room for error drum beats and he it was intense yeah i kept and, it, and then like the first take was good but the levels weren't okay the levels we got the levels right and then i like i the, i couldn't keep that tempo going the whole time it would kind of slow because it was just a constant and and i was getting frustrated then i could i mean jay was like you want to take a break i'm like no let's do it god and then it, it, it like it wasn't fun i was just like more you know just uh, everything so like storm the castle take 40 <laughs> yeah. well, like my arms falling off I'm just like, it's like all work too, you know. It it should be fun, but it also is definitely work yeah. to to set the time aside and to make the material and to you know just to be a part of it. Like you gotta you gotta be willing to put some of yourself into it. And Amy and Drew who are here. Um, Amy is an accomplished uh, pianist, so she plays a Yamaha YC organ, and she's amazing. She writes little uh, like riffs and chords and then obviously um drew is a musicologist so he's uh he can play anything so the, the the pressure and the ante is way up you know when they're on on their game so it's been exciting yeah i uh that's got to be a weird dynamic in a way to have the yeah, they'll say this is, a, is this four four time and we're like oh, what does that mean and so yeah. they have to explain <laughs> that you stomp your foot four times in a row and that's what it is. i'm right there with you yeah yeah i i know i've the first bands I was in, I just lied my way into them by telling people I could play this or that. I would just tell people I could play bass, you know, because I figured it seems easy enough and got to be at like that first band practice where they're slowly realizing that like I don't know what I'm doing and they are like having to like show me on the fretboard, like point my finger at like the things I have to do. That's just, that's mortifying. So I'm glad that you guys, that they knew coming in right away that uh, they were at a different skill level than you guys and there was going to be a bit of a curve involved. That's interesting you said that because we bought a uh, Warlock um, bass at Rock House Music in Milwaukee. And we, first time Jay played it, he nailed it. He was like, this is easy. Like, hell yeah. Uh, got it. Done. It's all about attitude and expectations. <laughs> it was better when Steve made the uh, shot bow because it's one string. Oh, oh that thing is super cool. He showed me pictures of that. Yeah, yeah it's awesome. Yeah. So one string, I was like, I got it. Let's go. <laughs> I saw it in a book in um, my grandpa's Appalachian Instruments book, but it was like a box with a eyelet with a string or a yeah, guitar string coming out of a hole with a loop. And he was just like, apparently plucking it, you know, and pulling with his finger to make the tension. And yeah. then Steve was like, oh, we can make something way better than that for Jay. And then cranked That's out how that. wash tub bass works, theoretically, yeah. I think, yeah. right? Yeah, cool. Yeah, Steve's a pretty fun guy. He's always building cool shit. Yeah. Well, even when we reach out to him early on, we're like, we need a drum kit. We're trying to find a really cheap drum kit. And I don't know where he got it from, but some of you know, I think too, Tom, I don't know. But we bought a drum kit from Steve. I drove up there to Milwaukee to pick it up one day for $125. Since then, we've replaced the heads and kind of improved the sound on it and got some new cymbals and stuff, but still the same thing. That rules. And, yeah. you know, when you're starting out, Anything will do pretty much, you know what I mean? It doesn't really matter. Yeah, for sure. I was impressed when Jay and I were up there about your box of all the different instruments you have, like the finger cymbals. And so I'm kind of obsessed with trying to find, you know, different kinding, kind of sounding instruments and stuff to back little shakers percussion, and percussion stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, yeah. That stuff's fun. Yeah. I um I don't know. I I have so much shit like all over the place, like musical related, and I just love picking something up and fucking with it you know and seeing what could happen like i'm recording more music by myself again i've been in like a pretty like heavy period of working on music a lot and it's just a blast i just get such a kick out of it we use a handheld task cam uh recording straight from the pa or we go through a board 
what do you guys use for uh, recording? I still use an eight track cassette machine. Nice. And I just just recently started editing uh, in like a digital, like on the computer. I used to I used to just do everything on a tape and then put it onto like a CD burner, like a standalone CD burner, and then send that stuff off. And I got really tired of not being able to edit anything. You know, like if I wanted to like just trim like an ending or a beginning or whatever, I'd have to do the mix all over again. Oh wow! It took me like ten or fifteen years of putting up with that. Just downloading Audacity on the computer and learning how to use it. And it's so easy, but it really has uh, been a huge new tool for me to use. So that's been a lot of fun. We, we can't do a whole lot, but what we do is it's just the task cam. And then afterwards, I put it in Adobe Audition just to trim the ends, basically. Yeah, yeah. And maybe yeah, adjust good. overall levels, but I can't mix it much. Yeah, well, that's cool. that's cool. There's less to worry about then. Yeah. You said the guy that does their seven inches has to do something, right? Yeah, and he and like like the, I uh, he he said like kind of what he would expect as far as like levels go, and I'll make sure it's within whatever he has. But I'm sure he does more to it once he gets it, just so it sounds okay on the seven inch versus you know digital or something. It's much more crunched. Do you guys approach the band pretty much the same way that you would approach the collaborative art projects that you've done before, or is there something different? That's like, kind of the same. I yeah. think so. I think it's the same as it's always been, really. And more or less, it's, it works just because I don't think we really, uh, like, like if I'm doing something, I don't expect Chris to, to, to buy in. We, we just do it separately, but then we are, it's blended, kind of. Like, there's no, uh, like, he doesn't tell me, oh, do this and this and this. Like, he's like, I'm going to do this. And then I'm like, I'm going to do this. And Nate's like, I'm going to do this. And then we just put it together. It's kind of weird. I don't, I don't like to collaborate on the songwriting at all. Like, I don't want anyone else in the songwriting credits. And I get a little upset because Nate will have, like, you should change this one word to this and it like really makes a song i get kind of bent out of shape because it's like <laughs> like it's like i had a record and now it's like 30 songs that i wrote and now it's like plus one that i wrote with nate and it's like <laughs> <laughs> that was a uh, that was sinkhole right yeah sinkhole no that was goddamn usa uh, there was I feel like it's like something like we switched the sinkhole to my sinkhole it was like two word yeah. difference and so but it changed the whole song yeah <laughs> that's how bands fall apart <laughs> when you get your stuff recorded tom are you going to play it on your radio show Can i can't you play your own? i can't promote myself no so i'm not allowed to do that hmm. what, what if we call in and request it <laughs> i still can't i still couldn't play it other other djs play my stuff sometimes nice. but i i can't really uh talk about it or play it sure what like I, it's kind of weird that you've played ours to be honest like that's a like a pretty cool yeah. show we're like honored random <laughs> the first time i played uh watercolor well there was like an amber alert or some kind of like emergency <laughs> broadcast <laughs> that came on and like preempted it you know so then i played it again uh nice i wonder if anybody listening is like oh thank god that alert came in and stopped that song <laughs> you're like no wait we're gonna do it one more time <laughs> yourself a sable rush find a pillow for your tish time to paint some pretty trees time to paint some honey bees i also uh i i turned in uh all bark all bite was one of my favorite releases of the year <laughs> Uh, at the end, I you know you pick like your favorite five of the year, and that that was one of my faves. One of my that records. Awesome. Care Bears in the Fog, man. Love that. Uh, I see those care bears in the fog. I see those care bears. So if you picked all, all all bark and all bite as one of your favorites of last year, what do you think as far as the difference between Dungeons and Drag? Yeah. Do you have a favorite? Is this one still ruling? Well, okay. Honestly, I love I love watercolor well so much. And it's got like a real Appalachian feel to it. Like to me, uh, that's just like a legitimately awesome, like weird song. I like all your songs, but that one really like grabbed me right away. Um, I love Dungeons and Drag. Kelly fucking loves the title. She's so jealous that she didn't think of it first. <laughs> um, I've played I've played <laughs> I just now noticed that it says side two and side B. <laughs> I played side two in its entirety on my radio show. 
uh, I wanted to play Not Gonna Clean My Room because it's my favorite song, but uh, there's an F-bomb in there. <laughs> I had to avoid that one. Yeah. But um, I, I, I really like them both, but to be honest, I think that there's something uh, less cluttered about the sound of All Bark, All Bite. Yeah. I think uh, Dungeons and Drag is awesome. It sounds more blown out, which it sounds cool like that, but having both to compare them to, I think I prefer the sound of All Bark, All Bite. Interesting. Yeah, I think it's a more simple sound for sure. Yeah. More deliberate. That's probably my fault. I'm always trying to blow things out. I buy pedals to blow things out, and I'm trying to blow out my voice. I got my yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 That's pretty good. It's sexy. Yeah, you're looking good, man. <laughs> I keep this on my nightstand. <laughs> nice. uh, I like when, when we did watercolor well it was funny because I was like shocked when Chris was singing this what the hell <laughs> uh, he just brought it. I, can't, I can't play that at home because he thinks the, the vocals are just too affected drives her nuts <laughs> <laughs> it's such a straightforward song though in its way yeah. you know like I, I love that about it I love that you know a lot of people make really blown out sounding music that is just kind of like dirgy and you can't really discern much of what's going on in it but it doesn't have any endearing quality to it you know what i mean and you it's guys soul. yeah you guys definitely do have uh there's a, a fun and a playfulness and also a, a sincerity to it that that comes through and i think that is way more important than the sound of the recordings or anything else is that you guys are approaching it sincerely but also with uh a so sense indeed. of humor. You're giving you're giving yourselves room to have fun with it because it should be fun in the first place. Well, thanks, Tom. Yeah, yeah thanks. We'll, we'll get up there soon. Chris was talking about trying to uh, make another trip to Milwaukee sometime soon. Yeah, it's a good. Yeah, plan. my uh, my pickup went out of my Aria Diamonds. I need to get up there and drop it off with uh, Rusty. Okay. Yeah, he can rewind pickups. Yeah. Awesome. I'll let you know when I'm up there. Cool. Yeah, please do. Have a good weekend, guys. Bye. Bye. See, See ya. ya. See ya. It was very natural. I like this one. Yeah. <laughs> I knew, I knew it was going to be good. Absurd. This was way easier than my interview with uh, 